Now what happened to the Atlantean is one of the great riddles of history. Uh, the old tradition tells us that the tragedy was due to the fact that the mental nature of man is twofold in structure. Man has a positive and negative polarized mind. And the negative polarity of the mind is what we would call physical mind or mortal mind. And the positive pole is divine mind or spiritual mind. These two poles have to finally be balanced. But in the Atlantean, they were not balanced. The Atlantean, emerging through his own corporeal structure, but still locked largely within body, produced the progenitor of what we call materialism. He was strong, he was skillful, he was keen, but he lacked reflective power. He lacked the power sufficiently generated uh, to enable him to estimate the moral and ethical values of existence. In his earlier period, this moral, ethical, spiritual directive was provided by the adept school. But in the middle period of Atlantis, the time came for the individual to pass out of the protection of the adept system and toward self-determinism. In other words, there comes always the problem in parental guidance as to when guidance must stop. If guidance is prolonged beyond need, the child is damaged. And the need for the Atlantean to become self-responsible as a moral agent forced the gradual retiral of the shepherd kings or the initiate teachers, the great sages, who retired from society into their schools, which means that they retired from embodiment. They were no longer born as Atlanteans becoming part of the race. They retired into their own higher uh, natural forms and became teachers. As teachers, they were available but had to be solicited. The disciple could still seek them, but he must search for them by a decision of his own will. Their help was not inevitable. He must desire it, he must demand it, he must respect it, and he must obey it of his own accord. This severance in which the parent, though still available for counsel, no longer recognized the need to determine the solution for the child. This division resulted apparently in the destruction of the Atlantic Empire, inasmuch as the Atlantean, uh, deprived of parenthood or parental guidance, was unwilling and unable to make the adjustment to moral individualism. As a result of that, he became torn with pride. He said, we are the great people of the earth. We are the rulers of all things. We do not need the gods. And there are ancient records that say that these people denied the gods to exist and said that their own human will was strong enough to rule the world. They accepted nothing superior to themselves and said that knowledge was the only thing by which worlds could be conquered. As a result of this arrogance, as described by Plato, the gods in their great assembly upon the Olympian Mount decided that it was necessary to chastise these people and to remind them that any excess of destructiveness must either be blocked or it will ultimately corrupt the soul as well as the body. And so to preserve the souls of these beings from the tyranny of knowledge and from magical arts and from the spells and incantations of the Dugpas, the entire continent was destroyed. But before it was destroyed, the teachers selected from it 
all who were not themselves corrupt, led them out of the Posidonian Isle, and through a long and circuitous route brought them ultimately to Asia. So that when Atlantis sank, those that had deserved a better destiny had already departed from it. Those who did not deserve a better destiny were held in suspension for rebirth in a new order of life where their experiences uh, would enable them to reorient. Out of the collapse and rubble of the Atlantean world, and particularly out of this order of life that had made the pilgrimage from the site of the ancient Posidonian culture all the way to the vast trans of Central Asia. From this, the nucleus of the next or the fifth race began to develop. The race which the Indian, the Hindu particularly, calls the Arya or the selected, the chosen, the destined, and which we have involved in our term the Aryan race. Now the Aryan race uh, is said to have been under the leadership of a great teacher or a great being who was called the Manu. And the institutes of Manu were given by him presumably through his sages and scholars for the preservation, direction, and guidance of his people. From himself he produced seven sages who were the seven sons of light, and one of these also gave to the world the great teachings of the Puranic literature, which describes the origin and development of these people. And one by one the great rishis or sages like Vyasa, revealed the law. The Vedic writings were also given. And in the course of time, the will of the Manu was uh, impressed upon the entire culture of his world. Now it is said that after the great migrations and the, the, the long and difficult troubles that were attendant upon the formation of the race, there is an ancient legend that the iron race, as we know it, began with 25 families, which alone have survived the name numerous vicissitudes which were involved in this tremendous migration and also in the tremendous culturing process that nature was attempting in this womb of races high in the mysterious land of Gobi. In any event, the Manu, or the leader, became not only the father of the race, its teacher and its progenitor, but he bestowed upon it, as was always the case with races, bestowed upon it the seed of its own survival. And the race lives because of the generative power of the Manu, who set in motion the line of descent and made the race fertile rather than sterile. The Manu also the great leader of the race has been absorbed into the race itself and is part of its internal structure and will emerge only when the race is complete. Now this race, starting its tremendous migration, broke into a number of sub-races, for each race has seven sub-races. And each uh, species prior to the individualization of a race in the earlier period had seven subspecies. The, the Lemurian was unique. It had three species, three sub-races, and a link between them, which was a combination or joining of species and race, or the tipping of one into the other. The Atlantean had seven sub-races, and the Aryan has seven sub-races. Now, of the seven sub-races of the Aryan, the first, of course, was the father-mother race, the total body of the Arya. This total body of the Arya is embodied, personified, and represented psychologically by the great archetypal symbol of the Manu, who is the race. The race, therefore, becomes his children, his progenitors, and the division or individualization of himself through the race. It is also the Manu, or the power of the race, 
that must ultimately be restored or resurrected through the restoration of the race. In the perpetuation of the species, 14 divisions of Manus are established. Seven arising at the beginning of sub-races and seven at the ends of sub-races. And these 14 together represent the great legal structure or extensions or differentiations of the one leader or the one teacher himself. They are the witnesses or manifestations of his power. Up to this time there have been five of the sub-races of the Aryan race that have appeared. The first was re re uh, generally is termed the Arya constructively and represents the great Indic race stream rising in northern Asia and flowing down through this great valley of the Indus through the Indo-Gangetic plains finally moving southward. The second race or the second sub-race of the Aryans was the Aryan Semite and the Aryan Semite, differing from the Atlantean Semite, moved into what we call Syria and the Holy Land and became a distinct race. The Syrian, the Lebanese, the Arab, and the uh, Palestinian Jew are all Aryans because they belong to the second great branch of the Aryan people. The third great branch was the Iranian which moved into Persia and all that vast area at that time. The fourth division was the Celtic, which moved all the way across, producing the Greco-Latin civilization and finding a strange and mysterious abode in Ireland. The fifth was the so-called Anglo-Saxon Teuton, which is essentially the, uh, the racial group of which the, to which most of the uh, modern Western people belong, although the division is quite confusing. But these five migrations or divisions of the great Aryan race have led us to our present state. Now, let us go back for a moment and consider this racial structure from a little different position. And that is try to visualize a, a diagrammatic presentation of it. Each one of the processes of creativity which we recognize is orderly in nature. And each one of the species that preceded man and each of the races that followed his individualization um, are part of a geometrical pattern uh, that unfolds with perfectly sequential growth structure. From the second species of the Polarian uh, total species, from the second subspecies of the Polarian, the second race or the second species, the Hypoborean, was created. After its creation, a differentiation took place. The old or Polarian epoch continued to its natural end, but the German seed of the second species came from the archetype of the second stage of the first species, because this represented one major step in growth. The third group, the Lemuria, therefore came from the third subdivision of the Hyperborean. And the fourth group, the Atlantean, came from the fourth division of the third group, now a race, the Lemurian. And the fifth race came from the fifth division of the Atlantean order. And the sixth root race will come from the sixth subdivision of the fifth and so on, all the way down, until the seventh race is born from the seventh sub-race of the sixth. Thus, each of these becomes a step, and once the step is made by what were called the pioneers who follow the direct line of race, then the races themselves begin to drift away, the carcass of the old race slowly drifting away from its place in the direct stream. And progress is always moving with these new groups that break off. Today, therefore, we are concerned with the sixth sub-race of the fifth race. 
This sixth sub-race must come into existence before the sixth root race can be born. Many questions have been asked as to where this sixth sub-race will come into existence and under what circumstances. First we know this, that a race can never be born from a homogeneous people. It must be born from a heterogeneous people. In under the law of polarity, a homogeneous people cannot generate. Therefore, wherever a new racial structure develops, you must have some kind of a polyglot. You know also that by means of this polyglot, a tremendous vitality, a new chemistry is set up. And a new racial structure, like the new wine, must have a new bottle to contain it. So gradually, out of the development of races, arises a polyglot. Now the second thing that is essential to the rise of a root race, or even a sub-race, is a land area. They will never come into existence in a small region, in an island, or in some isolated area. They must come into a large continental distribution, because this continental distribution which they take on, and where they are created, must survive the destruction or the great shifting which is going to result in a sixth continent for a sixth root race. The continents must change, but there must be this vast area suitable for the promotion, development, and propagation of a species or of a type of life. Now the question as to where the sixth sub-race of the Aryans will be uh, generated has been a question. Many people have thought and of course, perhaps with some egotism, that either what we call the Western Hemisphere or perhaps the great Australasian area will have to be the seed ground for this next sub-race. There are many who believe that on the Western Hemisphere as we know it today, a new sub-race is actually being formed. A sub-race in which uh, Many differences are noted between our culture and that of any other culture of our race. That we are producing almost a new biological type. That by degrees, out of polyglot, out of the mingling of peoples, the pioneering spirit, the various enterprises that we are indulging in, that we are creating a distinct pattern, which in time will be the source of the new sub-race. If that is true, then out of that sub-race must be formed the sixth root race. Now that will mean a division, because after the formation of the sixth sub-race, there will be another sub-race to close the cycle. But this sub-race will be a kind of anticipation or a foreshadowing of something, but will not in itself be fertile. The fertility will rest in the sixth subdivision. And this sixth subdivision, if it produces and does fulfill, will give us the sixth root race. Therefore, the sixth root race must be born to a measure or to a degree somewhere in the great area where the sixth subrace of our race functions. And the sixth root race we are told in the old writings, will have certain changes in it, by which gradually, through modification, the individual will have abilities or values which we do not have. One of the anticipated processes which is to be noted in the sixth sub-race of the fifth race, the one we are somewhere close to, is the gradual unfoldment of the extrasensory perception gamut. The sixth sub-race will gradually gain possession of the extrasensory band. Now this extrasensory band, as we know it, is only a magnetic psychic band. 
But when this reaches its culmination in the birth of the sixth root race, this will mean clairvoyance on the psychic or emotional level of life. It will mean that man will have an internal perception that the sixth root race, therefore, will be a race which is the first that we will ever know that cannot have a secret. <laughs> now, if you do not think that will change the course of history, just wait and see. <laughs> that the entire sixth race will have apperceptive or intuitive, inevitable and infallible knowledge. It will mean a total change in everything that we know. Everything, even transportation, housing, communication, cannot escape this. This one thing alone will change the total structure of our culture and change it in the most inevitable way because it is changed by the individual from within himself, his new relationships. The second important thing will be the increase and rapid development of the autonomic nervous system what we call, or used to call, the sympathetic nerve ganglia, or the soul ganglia. This means that there will be a gradual restoration of the androgene state of the, fir of the first primitive creation. And with the rise of the psychic ganglia within the individual, almost all processes of the body will come under the conscious will of the individual. His heartbeat will by, be by his own will. Also, by means of this development of the sympathetic ganglia, his control of such things as sickness and death will be very much greater than anything that we know today. In compensation for that, however, his sight will be restricted because the process is again under development then by means of which internal vision will be thrust upon him. We wonder how man can be torn away from materialism. Nothing can do it as quickly as astigmatism. <laughs> <laughs> the moment the outer life of man ceases to be focused within his sight perception, the entire structure that he knows will begin to disappear because he will develop then corresponding internal inducements. This does not mean that man will become blind, but that the thing will happen which has been more or less threatening for a long time, namely that man will develop increasingly what we call nearsightedness. And this nearsightedness will carry with it a magnifying or microscopic quality man will begin to perceive forms of life that he previously did not know to exist. And the combination of the extension of his extrasensory gamut with the development of microscopic sight and the voluntary control of processes of growth, assimilation, and even to a great degree of death will result ultimately in the sixth root race man becoming an entirely different looking creature, an entirely different conducting creature than anything we know today. Yet he will retain in general what we term his human proportions. But these will be refined and very highly specialized and will reach a point in which society, culture, education, religion, philosophy, these things will be strongly internalized and the total life of man will begin to move into him or move into his inner existence rather than being posited on the outside. His greatest environment will be his own internal. From the seventh sub-race of the sixth root race, an almost inconceivable projection into the future will finally come the seventh root race. And we are told that this race, like the first, will originate in the Trans-Himavat of Central Asia. This will be the race of man going home. It will be the return or the release of the gods and the godlings. 
that have been locked in human psychology for millions and hundreds of millions of years. The seventh race, therefore, represents uh, the production of a race which in the Indian mind uh, might be represented by Shiva the mendicant, seated on the top of the great mountains of the north. Well, this is the, the race, again, of the great uh, sacrificer, of the great mendicant. For in the seventh race, the meditational or internal life of man will take over. In the seventh race, man will live, think, function by the perfection of those faculties which we now associate with yoga. Man will attain the normal function of Raja Yoga. In that period also, the internal mental extrasensory perception will be completed, and he will be completely adjusted to the phenomena of internal and eternal universal thought. As the mendicant, he will then have completed and concluded his objective wanderings in time and space, and we will find him again retiring into the conscious meditation, drawing into himself and back into his own consciousness by degrees every form of life, thought, and emotion which he has externalized in the evolutionary processes. Then having attained, finally, complete union, having absorbed all the races within him back into himself again, he will approach the rest, or the pralaya, the sleep between orders of life. And when they awaken from this order of sleep, a man will start upon a new cycle of growth, which will take place on a higher world entirely from, which, from what he has known and where what we call physical matter will no longer exist. He will then continue on his evolutionary course, having escaped from the strange and mysterious density that has locked him here. We have another point or two that uh, the ancients tell us, namely that these cyclic periods required for the evolution of races and species decreases in time as racial evolution continues. They decrease in time because time decreases in significance. Uh, the Polarian period may have lasted for many thousands of millions of years. The, uh, the Aryan race is only a little more than a million years old. The Atlantean race had a survival of between four and five million years. The Lemurian race species extended for more than 50 million years. So as each evolutionary procedure progresses downward, the length of the racial spans, or species spans, is shortened. It is therefore very likely that our race will not endure for more than a comparatively short time, perhaps not more than a half or three quarters of a million years. This is something to really worry about, <laughs> especially in long-range investments. <laughs> it is quite possible that the sixth sub-race will appear within the next thousand or two thousand years. It is also quite possible that the sixth root race will be born within the next hundred or two hundred thousand years, born to the degree that we become aware of it. And it is quite possible that the sixth root race in its total extension will not survive more than a half a million years. These periods are constantly decreasing in time for the reason that man is outgrowing the experience boundaries placed by time. We realize this even in our daily living when we hear someone say, well, more happens to us in a year than happened to our ancestors in 50. We know this is happening. We know that the psychic life of man is functioning much more rapidly than ever before, that this tempo continues, and thus man's increasing consciousness is forever contributing to the rapidity of his growth in these various cycles. And as we get nearer to the end, the cycles diminish in length, so that the golden day we look for may not be as far off as some have imagined. We are past that terrible nadir in which uh, we confront it 
the Atlantean deluge. The fourth subdivision of Atlantis, the division which led ultimately to the deluge, and from which the fifth race began, from the survivors. The fourth division of Atlantis was the low point in the great, in the great involutionary arc of man. At that time, the evolution of man reached its lowest and most material state. And from then on, evolution has taken over. And growth is now inevitably and eternally upward. Man may, as he usually does, ascend a little like the crab by walking backwards. And in every cycle, there are arcs in which things fall away and there seems to be a loss or a breaking up a death of something. There are what Plato calls uh, sequential eras of sterility and fertility in nature. And there will be materialistic ages and there will be idealistic ages. And there will be scientific ages and philosophic ages. And there will be times in which it seems that man is bent upon destroying himself and other times when his nobility will shine forth with unusual splendor. But in all these ups and downs and curves and arcs of human progress, the ancient tradition tells us that we are inevitably moving upward. And that what we call reverses are now actually pressures exerted to make more rapid our progress. Because every reverse now is met by a greater equipment within man. And because man is better able to know than ever before. He is better able to meet adversity and grow directly as a result of it. This goes on and on and on and means that the cycle of races is shortening and that the degrees of attainment are also increasing in importance. The ultimate degree being that of the return of the race to its homeland, the close of the great cycle of humanity which closes where it begins in the mysterious Northlands of Asia, where the race goes home to sleep, and where once again uh, the earth receives into itself uh, the souls and beings of these creatures. Bodies then go to sleep, souls now consciously able to leave them, depart and return to their own estate, and await embodiment in the next great order of life an order of life infinitely higher than what we have. The first war was fought by the Atlanteans. The last war, it is said, will be fought before the end of the fifth root race. And that in the sixth and seventh, war will be unknown. And with all these changes, we know that the only way in which darkness and ignorance and death can become unknown is because the experience of man penetrates them. They can never be exiled, they can never be legislated out of existence. But when physiological, biological, and psychological changes in man make these things impossible, then the individual, feeling no frustration upon his natural life, chooses to follow the growth of the talents and abilities which he can no longer deny. Thus, by degrees, man outgrows everything that is inadequate and attains to everything that is necessary. And also, by degrees, I think you'd better go home. <laughs>